Revelation chapter 9 and verse 14. Saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Hi folks, I hope this video is finding you well, and I have a question, which is, who are the four angels spoken to in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 14? Side note, all this of course was envisioned in a dream given to John by Jesus, at the behest of our Father and cannot be interpreted literally. The meaning of the aforementioned verse is, that the effect of his blowing the trumpet would be the same as if angels that had been bound should be suddenly loosed and suffered to go forth over the earth, that is, some event would occur which would be properly symbolized by such an act. My friends speaking of four angels, some are of the mind that the four angels in the Euphrates are the angels whom left their first estate, referred to as the fallen angels in Genesis, whom are at this moment chained in the subterranean of the earth, spoken to in Jude chapter 1 and verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. My friends that says that the angels bound in the subterranean will be bound unto the judgment of the great day, so they cannot be the four angels bound in the Euphrates, and again, we are talking a spiritual loosing, and not a physical loosing. Let's move on, it was customary to represent important events as occurring under the ministry of angels, whom are by definition messengers of God. The general meaning here is that in the vicinity of the river Euphrates there were mighty powers which had been bound or held in check, which were now to be let loose upon the world. What we are to look for in the fulfillment is evidently this, some power that seemed to be kept back by an invisible influence as if by angels, now suddenly let loose and suffered to accomplish the purpose of desolation. Maybe Daniel the prophet can shed some needed light, on our query. Daniel chapter 10 and verse 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. My friends our hearts too need certain understanding as we chasten ourselves before our God. Let us pray, Lord Father God Yahweh please hear our words of prayer, help us to determine what is meant in these stanzas as to get a better understanding of these the end days, as to equip us as to serve you better and to add comfort to those unsteady and questioning in fear the up and coming engagement, and we pray this in the name of your son Jesus, Amen and Amen. Folks it has been made a question why the number 4 is specified, and whether the forces were in any sense made up of 4 divisions, nations, or people. While nothing certain can be determined in regard to that, the number 4 may be used merely to denote a great and strong force, and it must be admitted that the most obvious interpretation would be to refer it to some combination of forces, or to some union of powers, that was to accomplish what is here said. If it had been a single nation, it would have been more in accordance with the usual method in prophecy to have represented them as restrained by an angel, or by angels in general, without specifying any quantity, however the number four was used. That verse says that those angels which are bound, that is, they seem to be bound, meaning there is something by the will of God which holds them, and the forces under them, in check, until they were thus commanded to go forth. Let's see what Moses had to say concerning the same in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 31. And I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea even unto the Sea of the Philistines, and from the desert unto the river, for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and thou shalt drive them out before thee. Folks the river spoken to here by Moses is the river Euphrates. That verse clearly speaks to bounds, how about what is found written by Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 7. Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria, and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels, and go over all his banks. Woe horse, did you catch that folks? Well for those of you always two steps ahead of me, I know you caught it, and you're right, the waters of that river Euphrates are representative apparent of people, strong and many, and one of those people named is the king of Assyria, which is east of the Euphrates, who will do what? That's right, he shall come up over all his channels, and go over all his banks. 
Good I folks, and I see our prayer is being answered and is serving us well. Let's see, this river is east of Jerusalem, and the language used here naturally denotes that the power referred to under the sixth trumpet would spring up in the east, and that it would have its origin in the vicinity of that river. The fair interpretation is that there are forces in the vicinity of the Euphrates River which were, up to this period, bound or restrained, but which were now suffered to spread desolation over a considerable portion of the world. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 12 And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Here the east is spoken to again, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. My friends what kings are found east of the Euphrates river? Yea the kings of the east make up the oriental confederacy, so what pray tell is that? One of the significant developments of the 20th century is the political and military awakening of the Orient. The great nations of Asia east of the Euphrates river, slumbering for centuries, are now beginning to stir and to become a major factor in the international situation. The geographic immensity and the millions of humanity involved make it inevitable that any future development embracing the entire world must take the Orient into consideration. In our 20th century the major nations of Asia have thrown off the yoke of political overlordship of Western civilization, which earlier kept them bound, confined in place, immovable, which is certainly not the case as we speak. Red China with its population exceeding 1 billion people is flexing its muscles not only against the United States of America, but even against its comrade, associate, or wingman and neighbor, communist Russia. Folks India, now independent of Great Britain, is likewise beginning to feel its strength, as well, Japan is experiencing a great industrial revolution where the comforts and manufacturing techniques of Western civilization are now an integral part of Japanese life. Lesser nations also are beginning to assert themselves, hoping for a large role in world affairs. Most of this has taken place in the last 50 years or so, and developments continue to be rapid. Even if there were no scripture bearing on the place of the Orient in end-time events, it would be only natural to expect them to be part of the worldwide scene. End days, Red China, Russia, Syria, with no stone left upon another, can anyone say Gog and Magog? It is understood and agreed that Gog and Magog are identified as Russia and China respectively, which we know are east of the Euphrates. Folks can we determine that the use of the word angels represents instruments of God to execute his vengeance, I say yea, for as we know, an angel is also a messenger from God, and it will be God that brings the desolation and destruction to this world, not Biden, or Trump, and all of its inhabitants shall be ill-affected, save the children of Israel, yea God's house, as well those which Jesus spoke to, others that I must bring unto my Father. If those four angels are indeed messengers from God, is worldwide destruction not a stern and lasting message? Again, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 14. Saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. My so beloved brothers and sisters here, let's be clear, the four angels just spoken to are not the four angels found referenced in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Nay, the four angels in the Euphrates are not the four angels spoken to here, as they still stand upon the four corners of the earth. My friends please make no mistake, angels are sometimes employed, by our Father, in the killing of great numbers of men. 2 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 15 So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed, and there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba seventy thousand men. Great stake please, thank you Mickey. Folks we have just happened upon something that I find very interesting, just as waters at times represent people, in Ta Biblia, in this verse the word pestilence also means people, or spokesman, and here is the explanation. My friends pestilence is Strong's word number H 1698, with the H denoting a Hebrew word, and the Hebraic word for pestilence is XAC, 
pronounced Deborah, and means to subdue, answer, appoint, bid, command, destroy, say, speak, as a spokesman. Again, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 14. Saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Folks if loosed from the river what would they do, I mean what would be their mission? Here's a thought, what if those four angels are the four horsemen of the apocalypse, my friends if they are each messengers from God, we know what those messages will be, don't we? Now, here is the first of those four horsemen loosed, found in Revelation chapter 6 and verses 1 through 8. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come, and see. And I saw, and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering, and to conquer. Folks the Lamb opening the seals was Jesus, even so the Lamb of God, being the first rider on the white horse, as we remember from earlier studies, a king always rode a white horse into battle, and the bow at the ready is apparent of the enemy being a distance away, so the combat was not hand to hand, and the king went forth conquering, and to conquer, and we know that the apocalypse is the final battle and all would be conquered. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come, and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Yea a horse blood red whereas the rider would take peace from the earth, and would kill one another with a great sword, and that is the hand to hand combat that I mentioned a minute ago. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come, and see. And I beheld, and lo a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The price given, a penny, denotes great famine, though not an entire absence of food, since a man's wages would barely suffice to obtain him food. Barley, which was the coarser food, was obtainable at one third of the price, which would allow a man to feed a family, though with difficulty. Then it says, And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The meaning of this is, There is a prohibition to the writer, Hurt not thou the oil and the wine, which is certain restraint on the design of the writer, who would injure the spiritual oil and wine, that is, the means of grace, which had been typified under those symbols in ancient prophecy. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come, and see. And I looked, and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. My so beloved adjacents here, a white horse, a red horse, a black horse and a pale horse, so I ask you again, are the four angels in the Euphrates the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Four angels in the Euphrates, firstly, their purpose is to slay the third part of mankind. Here is one thing the four angels in the Euphrates and the four horsemen of the apocalypse have in common, each and all will cause death in earth, the four angels in the Euphrates will kill a third of mankind, and four horsemen of the apocalypse will kill with a bow, a sword, while one carried a scales which equals or balances, and the last horseman's name was death, and hell followed with him. So through study we can determine so far that the four angels in the Euphrates and the four horsemen of the apocalypse having the same duties could in fact be the same entities, as each separately will kill people in that day of judgment, so the four angels bound, and the four horsemen of the apocalypse could very well be the same messengers and servants, could they not be, and to tell you the truth, I have never heard that stated before, and I ask you, with our father's help did we just discover a revelation, no pun intended? Yes, I believe we did, and remember our prayer to our father earlier, and just as with Daniel, we beseeched our father's help, and as we know, prayer is a powerful instrument, and I find myself of late praying unceasingly, as instructed, and on that note, be well, stay strong, and I thank you so much for listening my friends.